All right, good morning. I'm talking today about uh, Reverend Hart. I wasn't sure what that meant when I started, but as I started writing, I kind of figured it out. Um, you know, we often talk about karma and our spiritual evolution here, that when we take an action, that action goes into the law, or the law acts upon what we've done, and there is a reaction. So the universe is always seeking to sort of balance the energy, to balance the account of what we've put out and what we're getting back. Um, so I, I very clearly remember uh, many years ago, I, had, uh, I really hadn't come into this teaching yet, but I heard a friend say, what goes around comes around. Now, to most of us, that's probably pretty obvious, and we've heard it for a long time. But at that time in my life, I had never heard it. In fact, I remember finding a napkin and writing it down on the napkin. I thought, oh my god, that's really important. I've got to remember that. What goes around comes around. Um, so it wasn't favoritism. It wasn't retribution. What a revelation. It was just what goes around comes around. What you put out comes back to you. So that's not really news. It, it, I mean, it is not really news today that our attitude is very important. Why? Because everything we do carries the energy with which we do it. In other words, our consciousness makes an imprint on every single thing we do and on every action we take in the world, and that's what goes out there, right? Consciousness permeates all. So it makes sense to me that we are all having the experiences we need uh, right now for our spiritual growth and for our soul's evolution, whether I like it or not. I'm having the experiences I need for my soul's growth. So the first thing I think when I say that is, okay, what do I need to get out of this experience so I don't have to keep having the experience, especially if the experience is not a good experience or it's not the experience I would prefer. Right? What do I need to get out of this? Because once I've gotten everything I need to learn from the experience, then the energy shifts and something else will show up. So I think, you know, what's the attitude we go into our daily experiences with? You know, what's my attitude toward my own growth? What's my attitude toward other people? You know, we're going to um, feed the homeless this afternoon uh, at North Hollywood Park. Um, and you know, as, uh, so on one level, bringing people food is a great thing to do. But remember also that we are students in the science of mind. And I think the greater thing that we do is that what we bring to those people is a vision of them as not poor you. What we do is we know that God is fully present in all of them, and it just so happens that we're serving the food and they're eating the food, and we get to visit and eat and be together. You know, this is, this is really important because it seems to me that there are very few places where we go in life and people look at us like they're seeing divinity. That doesn't, ha have you noticed, that doesn't happen a lot out in the world. But when we come together as a community, we're reminded of that, and certainly when we do a service project, you know, but then, say, beyond the service project, when we're driving down the street and you see these little tent cities all around town now, they're everywhere. Where does our mind go? Do we say, oh my God, that's a blight on our city? Or are we saying, you know, there's God in expression in each of these people, you know, that everybody is working through what they're working through, and if I'm going to be a good metaphysical spiritual student, and I know this is difficult sometimes, if I'm going to be a good metaphysical spiritual student, I have to look at a difficult condition in the world and say God is present there even in the midst of that. So I drive by those tents and I say God lives in that tent and God lives in that tent and God lives in that tent. And this is what I hope we will endeavor to do this afternoon. You know, when, when we're feeding some people who, so they say, uh, you know, they, they're, they're dealing with the appearance currently of homeless. But you know, also remember, you know, or it's important for me to remember that none of these people, when they were 18 years old and getting ready to start their life on their own, said, hmm, what should I do? Be an executive? No, no, I think I'll be homeless. Yeah, that's it. That would be really interesting. Now, for whatever reason, this is part of their journey. You know, so the other thing I want to say about this, that, you know, uh, back to uh, my attitude toward my own growth, is that if I'm angry as a person, I'm going to respond to life with anger. Right? You know, and that's going to set the law in motion, and I'm going to experience more anger. You know, and so, so it just, if, if I'm somebody who's a very sorrowful person, you know, and, and I respond to things in a sort of a down, sorrowful way, then I'm going to have to experience the results of that sorrow that I keep putting out into the world. So what about reverence? It's not, 
When I talk about reverence, it's not just respect, although I think it includes that. I think a reverent heart really is a heart that sees the divinity in all people. I believe that this will actually change the quality of our living. It will change the quality of our learning. If we know everywhere we go, God is present in this person, God is present in this person, God is present in this person. If I don't see God in all that's... Uh, in, in all, if I'm, if I'm not seeing God in all, that's, that's going to be um, interesting karma that I keep creating, you know, because quite simply how I treat every person and, and every living thing, you know, Ernest Holmes teaches us again and again that God is all there is. That's the message of science of mind, that God is all there is. You know, you've heard the saying that it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. Well, I'm glad I have not actually witnessed that. That would be very upsetting to see a dog eating a dog. I, that would really mess with my head. Um, but we understand the thinking of competition. We un understand the thinking of survival, that somebody wins and somebody has to lose. We understand that, that thinking that's so predominant that there's not enough of the good stuff in life, whatever that is. There's not enough love, there's not enough money, there's not enough work, there's not enough creative opportunities, there's not enough health. Would we behave differently if we had a reverent heart? And I think the answer is yes. Asking daily, God help me to see the divinity in everyone I meet today, in every person I see. So I will tell you that I've had occasion in the last two weeks to spend time. In fact, three times I had to go to the DMV. Now, when I think of the DMV, my history thinking of the DMV has not been what a light-filled place. <laughs> you know, what a center of efficiency and calm and love and centeredness. That has, up until now, not been my experience. But um, it was time to renew my license and my registration and do the smog thing and all that stuff. So I had to go back and forth. I, this was my own doing. I made it much more complicated than I needed to. I waited too long. I couldn't make the appointment online. So don't tell me I can make an appointment online. I know that now. It's just that by then, it was months down the road. Uh, so if you are planning on going to the DMV, plan months ahead of time. That's my word of encouragement. And bring a really good book. I mean a really good book. A really good book. So knowing that my attitude based on the past experience of DMV was not particularly good. I mean, I think the last time I left the DMV, I went out and banged my head against the hood of my car um, uh, just to shake myself out of that experience. But this time I decided, you know, if I'm going to be going to the DMV, I need to be as conscious as I can possibly be. So I meditated a lot, and I prayed, and I praised and raised everybody in the DMV, not just the workers, but the customers. And I had a really good book. You know, the kind of book like, it's not a burden I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to read. Like, oh, I can't wait to read some more. One of those books. And I went to the DMV, and the first visit, I was there for about two and a half hours. And I tell you, it was the most pleasant experience. It was phenomenal. The most wonderful people waited on me. They were so good. They were terrific. And then when I wasn't being waited on, when I was waiting for my number to be called, I was just in this great book. And by the time I left, and I had to stand in a number of different lines and have a number of different numbers, by the time I left, I was shocked that two and a half hours had gone by. And it's like, I was like saying goodbye to my friends at the DMV. Bye, I'll be back. See you in a couple days, you know? And I did it again. And I did it a third time. And, and now, again, the drama of having to go three times was my own doing. I admit that, you know, just because I hadn't taken care of something I should have taken care of uh, ahead of time. But what I realized is, wow, I had so much opinion about how it was going to be at the DMV. I'm, perhaps I'm the only one. I don't know. Uh, but I had so much opinion, and I thought, that opinion is not going to serve me. So as a student of science of mind, what do I need to do? I need to change my thinking about that. I need to change my thinking. And so you know, going into the DMV, there is as much God in every person in the DMV, whether they're behind a desk or behind the counter or standing in line. God is present there. God is present there. And will I get hooked or not? Well, I have to say... I didn't get hooked, and I was really, really pleased. So all that praying and meditating and affirming really, really paid. Now, yes, I still had to wait two and a half hours, but that was me. That wasn't the DMV. All right? So we might notice if we 
if we curse someone, if we take advantage of someone, if we disempower someone, including ourselves, I would say, if we judge one person as good and another person was bad, you know, or, or, or how we even treat our earth that we live on, this is why, you know, this is why I find Westerners don't like the idea of reincarnation as much as people from, east, from the East. If we knew we were coming back, we might not make such a mess of things. You know, I think we, we create different karma when we are reverent. So Ernest Holmes teaches us in The Science of Mind that we are all connected. You know, that there's one life and that we have contact with the essence of everyone and everything. So don't we all know that who we are is more than this physical body? Yes, of course. If you come to church here, you have some inkling that who you are as a being is more than this physical body. You know, so then, then it's not much of a stretch that that is also true about other people if it's true about us. That other people are more than the circumstances we might see them in or what they're encountering right now. So uh, recently I went to uh, the Marshall Theater where they're doing um, Lady Day, they're performing uh, Lady Day at Emerson's Bar and Grill. So this is Billie Holiday. And it takes place, I believe, um, a couple of months before she actually dies. And um, and this was such an interesting thing to me because here is this woman of such tremendous talent and yet she really struggles with her own demons. Yet she has this incredible talent, but she has these horrible demons. But this talent, but these demons, you know? And it's really, and I thought, I left thinking, this is like all of us because we're all a combination of light and dark. We all have those areas where, where we can shine and we can be our best self and we can be loving and we can be terrific and give our gift. And then we have those areas where we really, really struggle. So what was so interesting about, about Billie Holiday was the extremes of, of her light and, and her dark, for me. Um, that, uh, you know, and I think great beings have had an attitude of honoring life. I believe that beings like Jesus did this and Buddha did this, that they saw that life was holy and sacred. Now, we could begin to do this ourselves, you know, and, and we get to define holy and sacred for us. Because what's holy for me is probably a little different what's holy for you. What's sacred for me is maybe a little bit different than what's sacred for you. But I suggest that it recognizes God in all, right? So I believe a reverent heart looks, um, a, a reverent heart loves life and is conscious of it and is aware of it. So people might think, well, you know, yeah, I, I guess I love my life, or, or you know, uh, and, and I'm really glad to hear that. I think that's, that's important. Um, because other people will say, well, I don't know, my life has a lot of difficulties right now. What's, what's to love? Well, then let's, let's think, if I did love my life, how would I be thinking? If I did love my life, how would I feel? If I was somebody who loved life, how would I act? If I was somebody who loved my life, how would I speak? See, I think there is a lot in love, in life to love. And if I loved my life and I was conscious of it, I think how I would show up would be somewhat different. You know, I know there's a lot of room for healing, for growth, for improvement. Probably all of us could say that. You know, but, but face it, being negative and reinforcing what you don't want has not done a lot of good for you. It has not done a lot of good for me. It hasn't done a lot of good for pretty much anybody. See, because nobody gets healed, nobody gets better when they feel like a victim. Nobody, you can't be negative enough that your situation gets better. You know, you know that, that everybody, everybody's evolving. And I understand we, we can be rougher on ourselves than we would allow anybody in our life to be. So maybe we're afraid if we, if, if, if we give the universe um, the message that, gee, I love life, that, it's not, that I'm telling the universe I don't want it to get better. And I think that's absolutely the opposite of how the spiritual principle works. Because what you focus on increases, right? That how it will get better is telling the universe how much you love life, right? And so if, so if we don't see life as holy and sacred, I think it's going to be cold and it's, it's going to get colder. See, because, and, and this type of thinking that I'm talking about, that seeing our life as, 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 as a good thing, you know, I think that, that that originates in our heart. You know, the heart is where heaven and earth come together. You know, uh, traditionally you have three chakras below the heart, three energy centers below your heart, and three energy centers above your heart. So the heart is where the two, heaven and earth, come together. The heart asks, how can I honor life? You know, what's one step I could take? Now, I know we don't often want to pay attention uh, 
to our heart, you know, because people often think, oh my God, I've just got to ignore that because if I don't, you know, um, if I listen to my heart, I'm going to become weak. I'll just be ineffective in the world. I'll be a doormat. But, you know, reverence is a way of being, and, and that way of being is through the heart. And I don't think that we're ineffective. I believe that actually we're more powerful and more effective. I believe this is how we want to be in the world, that if we lose sight of God is in all people, we could be capable of doing evil, because I think that's where, where when people do evil, they have absolutely lost sight of that. It's the evil is the absence of light. It's the absence of love. Now, in Science of Mind, we do not teach that evil is a power in and of itself. Evil is not a power opposed to God or good. It is the absence, the absence of light. So, you know, where there is darkness, we stumble. Where there is darkness, we're in error, right? So what's, what is the response to evil? You know, what is the response to this absence of light? Well, if you, if you just hate evil, right, which, which I think is a fairly common response, if we just hate evil, we actually contribute to that absence of light. You know, hating evil increases it, right? And you bring that suffering upon yourself, you know? So, so you actually are in the darkness now because you're hating the evil. So you have to do what you can and do what you are called to do to end suffering in your world. You know, and, and, and how I think we do that is by keeping compassion in our hearts. You know, we want to not become like what we say we hate. You know? So I think a compassionate heart can bring light where there was none. So, so the question we get to ask ourselves is, right, where and how can I bring a little compassion? How can I bring a little light to this situation? You know, uh, there's a story in the Bible where uh, they're getting ready to stone a woman to death who was taken in adultery. And what Jesus says to the people who've all got rocks in their hands is, uh, let he who is among you without sin throw the first stone. And what happens, of course, is that everybody leaves. It's like, oh, okay, he's making it really personal now. Who has never, ever done anything bad? You get to throw the first stone. Who's never had a negative thought? Who's never been judgmental? Who's never done, you know, made a bad choice? If you've never made a bad choice in your life, then you get to throw the first stone. And everybody disappears. And what he says to the woman, I think, is brilliant. He says, woman, where were your accusers? And she says, you know, there, there are none. And he says, go and sin or error no more. Learn from your mistake. This is what we're all to do. We're supposed to learn from what we've been through and hopefully make better choices in the next time. If we don't make a better choice, it'll come around again and we'll have another opportunity to make a better choice. So I think daily our choices are moving us more toward the light rather than toward the darkness. I, at least I hope that's so. So there's a, a writer I, I really love, Howard Thurman, uh, and he tells of watching an old man plant pecan trees. Uh, and there were just these little, little treelets. They were not more than about two and a half, maybe three feet tall. And he says, you know, why did you not select larger trees? So into, because that would increase the possibility of you seeing them bear fruit. You know, uh, you, you, if, if you planted bigger trees, the, the likelihood of getting nuts while you're alive is a good thing. And he says, well, these trees are cheaper, and I don't have a lot of money. And so he says, so, so, so you don't expect to live to see these trees reach sufficient maturity and bear fruit. And he says, no, no, but, but is that really important? See, all my life, I've eaten fruit from trees that I did not plant. And why should I not plant trees to bear fruit for those who may enjoy them long after I'm gone? Yeah, besides, the man who plants trees because he will reap the harvest has no faith in life. And I love that story. I love that story because it's, it's really a beautiful example of paying it forward. We all understand that, that, that expression, where you do good that's not going to directly impact or benefit you. It's going to be good for people down the road. So the fact is that much of life is made up of reaping where we have not sown. We all do that now. We all benefit from things that we did not plant. Right? And, and, and planting where we're not going to reap ourselves. You know, so, so if you um, uh, get involved and you come to our, our dinner for our teenagers, the lunch we're going to have to send them to camp, you know, I feel like making an investment in our kids is, um, is planting seeds that we may not fully see come to fruition. But I think about that and I think, gee, when I was a kid, people planted lots of seeds with me. You know, I mean, people bought greeting cards and 
wrapping paper and butter cookies and chocolate bars, and, and I was always selling something, I promise you. I was always selling something, you know? And I, and I was shameless. It's like, you know, here I am. It's a new week. I have a new project, you know? And I'd knock on people's doors and sell. And so I think this is what we're doing with, with our teenagers. We're planting where we may not see the harvest, but we know there will be a harvest, you know? And, and my hope is that these kids will grow up and they'll look back and say, you know, I went to this religious science church when I was a teenager, and boy, did that make a difference in my life. Boy, did that give me some tools and some skills to handle things in a greater way. You know, so scripture says, um, be not deceived. Do not kid yourself. God is not mocked. For whatever a man soweth in his heart, that shall he also reap. Let's pray. Thank you. So we just turn our attention inward for a moment to just become still and remember that here we are and God is. Right where we are is holy ground. The fullness, the allness of God, infinite loving spirit is right here. It's the truth about each and every one of us and it's the truth about every person in the world. So everyone we encounter is an emanation of God consciousness, of God light, of God love. And so I speak this word for us today knowing that we are willing to put more light and more love into the world. Because yes, what goes around comes around. And this is a very personal statement, meaning that what I give out, the energy I put out into the world is coming back at me. The attitude I put out into the world is coming back at me. And so I claim for all of us that what we give is great. We give great loving energy out into the world and that energy blesses people and heals situations that we don't even know about. We include in our prayer today our family members and friends, parents and children, all of those that we hold near and dear. And we remind ourselves that God is right where they are, that they are surrounded and filled, upheld, ministered to by that presence of the living spirit. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world that we live in. So all of those things that pull at our attention, all that's going on in the news and in the newspaper, we say God is present in all of that. Beyond the level of appearance, there is a spiritual reality, a spiritual dimension, a spiritual truth, and we touch into that now with our word, with our thought, with our prayer, and we know that God in all of that is greater than any external appearance. We bless our church, we bless all churches. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. There's so many paths to God because God's the only place to go. And so I know on the unseen side that we are all connected, connected with spirit, connected with each other. And so with a full heart, I give thanks that this is the truth, that we are all uplifted. And with a full heart, I just release this word, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen. Amen.